Hello. Hello. My name is Carrie Hayes, and with me is Sam Costanzo, and this is Angry Dead Women. We're talking about late beginnings. Yeah. Beginning yeah. again. And how so many people believe that if you haven't done something at that age when you're building your future, then there's no chance for you to do that thing after you've had the, the bulk of your experience on, on the planet, mm -hmm. you know? Yep. So um, we have two gals that we're going to talk about today. The first one is Grandma Moses. You, you know, when you brought up the possibility that we were going to be talking about Grandma Moses, first of all, I never knew Grandma Moses really, the name. I never thought they existed. Oh, you thought she was like Aunt Jemima. Or, yeah. Or well, Cohen. yeah. In, in, in that sense, you know, right. people always said, well, you know, she's as slow as Grandma Moses. And I'm like, oh, you know, you always thought. Right. But I didn't realize she was a real person until oh, yes. oh, you yes. proposed it. And then I did a little research on her. What an amazing lady. Well, to think that she had this prolific career that started, I think, after she was 78 years old, something like that. Yeah. yeah 78. And also to think that this woman was born during the Civil War and that she was five years old at the end of the Civil War. And that she didn't yeah. get started on her painting career until well into the 20th century. I mean, that's a lot of history. Yeah. yeah. And then and then to wake up at what age? 70? 70... 78. 78. Yeah. And start and realizing she wants to do painting. Right. Because she was too arthritic. I guess she had arthritis. Right. Yeah, she, she was had too arthritic. arthritic to continue with her embroidery endeavors. Yeah. And and then she ends up painting all this wonderful stuff, gets notoriety from the president, right. from the governor of New York. Yes. Yes. And then and then her her paintings get shown all the way around the world. How does that happen? Well, That's amazing. I think it has a lot to do with Kismet and um the the universe spinning or colliding or worlds colliding in the right kind of way, creating that kind of synergy. Because there are other elderly painters who I believe uh, people became very enthusiastic about. And then there were lots of imitators. Mm. But uh, Grandma Moses, I think she is like the first of her kind on that level who really became sort of a, a rock star. And she didn't even know she had the talent. That's what that what amazes me, you know, you all of a sudden you wake up one morning and you realize I'm going to try this or whatever and realize all of a sudden you got the talent. That's, that's incredible. You know, and if she didn't do it, the talent would have been wasted. That's really something to think about, isn't it? That if she didn't yeah. do it, it would have been wasted. Yeah. yeah. Now let's talk about the well, second woman. Well, yeah, Evelyn. Mm hmm um, so she, she, at a late age decided to be a flight attendant in an industry that is, well, at least uh, from what I re always recalled, you know, rather younger, younger, uh, women, uh, doing that role. Right. Well, now it doesn't matter. You see men doing it. And as a matter of fact, and I'm, I'm kind of jumping the gun here. Yeah. You see a lot of older women doing the work now. Uh, if, if well, you, I think if Evelyn Gregory fun. changed things because yeah. she wanted to start when she was 72 years old. She had been married. Her husband had died after 42 years of marriage. And she had also been the vice president of a bank. That is about as different <laughs> wow. from a flight yeah. attendant as I can possibly imagine. Uh, 180 degrees. Right. And she decided to apply. And she got lots of rejections, lots and lots yeah. and lots and lots of rejections. And then finally, I think it's called Mesa Airways hired her. I think that's pretty interesting. 
so, but, but you're absolutely right. And, and, and also there's another element here, you know, if you're in the banking industry in a high ranking level, mm-hmm. you're probably making some pretty good coin doing that work. Right. And to decide I'm going to go in a completely different industry, chances are your starting salary isn't going to be anywhere near what you were making. Nope. And you're going to be on your feet all day and all night. And dealing with people's attitudes mm-hmm. and good good and bad. Right. Why, why, why would you want to do that? I think she must have wanted <laughs> just, to do it so she could see the world. Maybe. You know, the glamour so. of of air travel uh, at that also, time there was maybe, a lot more glamour to air travel i think yeah yeah and you know maybe she was also trying yeah. to prove a point too mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. i think her, it's amazing her... which brings me to my guest <laughs> <laughs> this brings me to my guest miss gail lehrman who wrote her debut novel around the same time that evelyn gregory was applying for a job to become a flight attendant Ah. Gail's book is called Across Seward Park, and it is the story of a family on the Lower East Side of New York City, and it begins in 1916 and ends in 1965. And I have to say, I think it is one of the most breathtaking novels I have read this year. It knocked it out of the park. I fretted wow. afterwards whether I should even continue writing because Gail's gift is so powerful. <laughs> but it's quite a thrill when you see somebody who has decided for no reason other than they would just like to when they write a book. And it's a beautiful, perfect piece of art. I, I want to talk about your book. I want to talk about you. And I want to talk about because the interview that we did before my newsletter was actually a newsletter, I will be re upping so that it appears in my proper newsletter. Okay. And um, I don't even know where to begin. Because I know you said this took eight or nine years to write. But it reads with such verve and force mm. that it, it's like lightning speed. Uh, yeah. And, and so what, in your interview, you mentioned uh, missing the sounds of New York and the yeah. certain voices. Can you elaborate on that a little bit? Because the voices that you have are so specific and so um, vibrant, particularly Irving, yeah. that Tell me, tell me how they started speaking to you and who exactly is Irving inspired from? The voice. All right. There were several things. Mm -hmm. I moved out of New York when I was 47 years old with a two year old kid. And I moved to Portland, Oregon, never having expected to leave New York. It happened because my husband, because of my, because my husband couldn't stand working for Rudy Giuliani, who was then the mayor of New York. I wonder why. Yes, <laughs> and and we ended up in Portland. Um, he said, "I want to get as far away from him as I possibly humanly can." I, I won't. I won't go I, it, it, in his field. He's a, he was a public health right, right, whatever. This is where we end, ended up. <sighs> There's a real big difference between the East Coast and the West Coast. Yes. And so, so the, I mean, these, these are the different threads. One thread of where the voice came from was people out here are so polite. I joined a book group where one of the women uh, dropped out because somebody interrupted her while she was speaking. I grew up where you never got to finish your That's sentence. That's what we call a conversation in our country. Right. <laughs> so one thread was, I want to write about people who argue the way I grew up arguing. Mm-hmm. That was one thing. Another piece of it was, I have all often been struck 
by how people with very profound things to say end up using the cliched language that they grew up with because that's the language that they have. And, right. and I wanted to try to use that language and yet still communicate the depth of the feeling that lies behind it. So I wanted a character who spoke with the idioms and some of the cliches that I grew up hearing from my parents and my parents' generation. Right. 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 Well, the other thing, the other thing, you know how when you're, you're writing a book and you're reading about writing books and you're thinking about how do I give birth to a book and how does a book become great and blah, blah, blah. And there's this discussion about the big idea. So what's the big idea? In that and book? well, yeah, I mean, did you not get the book where they say what's the big idea? You must have read that book. All right, so you've heard, seen people talk about the big idea, you know, what makes books great. And the thing about your book is that the discussion of the labor movement and the conditions which drove people to become committed to the labor movement is so visceral. It's as though you've put us right in the center of the scene and you move it. Pew, pew, pew. I mean, it's incredibly cinematic. And it, it did, was that as a result of changing this, changing that, changing the, I mean, did you start this book many, many times or something? Because it's really, it's like watching, um, oh God, was it called Mean Streets? Yeah. The Martin Scorsese film, Mean Streets, or or The Godfather Part Two, when we see Robert De Niro establishing himself in Greenwich Village. I mean, it's it's so present. Um, I, I the original book was going to be multiple timelines with mm -hmm. Irv and a different young character who left the left the book when I decided. No, no, there was a a, a, a an Irish American girl named Rose. Hmm. who was going to come and work for Irv. In, but I couldn't find her character at all. And in working to find her character, yeah. Marisol popped in, walked into the store and became Rose's friend. And okay. when I couldn't, and Marisol was so much more engaging and enlivened and, and alive to me than mm -hmm. Rose, that Rose left and Marisol stayed. Right, right. Uh, um. So it's, yeah, it, I mean, the book that Irv was going to die at the end, I was going to have him pop off. Okay, well, let's, let's not, let's not talk about the end. Okay. I haven't gotten there. Oh, I haven't gotten there. Well, it's okay. Die. It's okay. It's okay. Know. I mean, you've okay. talked about it a lot in, in our, in novelitics okay. and stuff, but. Uh, <laughs> okay. No, he, I, I won't but say anything. Miriam, Miriam is masterfully drawn. Oh, thank you. And uh, it just. The way you handled the, the, the initial demonstration, the initial strike, the way, the, 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 geez, Louise, I mean, this book has an incredible future. It's got legs. Oh, thank you. I am very moved by people's struggles. I am, I have, I have, I am very moved by, by the efforts of ordinary people to impact their lives. And what happened on the Lower East Side in terms of um, the labor movement changed America. It changed, it gave birth to the New Deal. Uh, the, 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 what, what FDR did in the New Deal came straight line direct from what these 16 and 17 and 18 year old women did. And it's, I find it very moving. So it's, it's not hard for me to write about it. it it's, had you had parents, were your parents at all involved in, in the garment industry or in, in labor was, or were they social? My dad was a furrier, um, mm -hmm. um, which is tangential, but you know, I would go to his shop. He, he was a one man business. He was what's called a jobber. Uh, mm -hmm. But he shared a loft space with, with a, the Zoidis brothers who, who were sewing mink coats. Um, 
So, so I have a little bit of a flavor of that. My father grew up on the Lower East Side and was with left politics. So I grew up listening to it and hearing okay. it. Okay. Yeah. Um, it's so authentic. I mean, it's yeah. just, it was breathtaking. It's, bre- it's breathtaking to read this book. Oh, thank and, you. Um, and, you. you know, when people say, oh, well, you read my book and, and you do it and and then to be to be swept away while doing it is it's so rare thank you i it's really pleasure. appreciate that thank you very much so you moved when you were 47 mm-hmm. somebody in your book group dropped out because she was interrupted <laughs> and, and we all know that a woman at 47 has a lot more in common with a 17 year old girl in terms of ambivalence with the world and the changing landscape of their body than, than just about any other living person. So that must have been a tough move. And, and had the novel, was the novel percolating just in the very, very back of your mind at that time? No. What happened was I, I was originally an English teacher. I wanted to be a writer. I was, and I, in, I started my working career as an adjunct lecturer. You know about adjunct lecturers? Yes, they're never, they're, they work for free. That's right. I did mm-hmm. that. For Talk about your labor movement. Uh-huh. That's right. I got an MFA along the way. You studied with Grace Paley, right? Yes, she was, she was my thesis advisor. At, and at, that's how you learned to write like that? No, I stopped. I, uh, I mean, Grace Paley was an inspiring human being. Right. Um, but I was in my mid-20s. And frankly, the only thing I wanted to write about was how miserable I was. And I wanted oh, sure. everybody in the world to, rem- to know how miserable I was. Of course, of course, of course. And that, run- that, becomes, that becomes very uninteresting very quickly. I know, but it's such a mighty tradition. <laughs> <laughs> um, so anyway, I stopped writing. I, I stopped writing. I stopped teaching. Where were you I, teaching? Where were you an adjunct professor or you lecturer? Name, you name a community college within 50 miles of New York, and I was an adjunct lecturer there. Oh, you were everywhere. You were at Queens. You were at Hunter. You were at all I, those places. I was Queens. I was Hunter. I was CCNY, Ramapo, New Jersey, uh, uh, New Rochelle. Um, you were a girl for hire. Community college. Yes. Mm-hmm. All in the same, often in the same day, actually. Right. So, so you were tired. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so I, I became a computer programmer and I left teaching and I stopped writing and I started doing other art things. I studied voice and acting. I did, did amateur acting. Oh, that explains a lot. Yeah. Because, you know, yeah. This book is so dynamic and there are so many voices and yet we don't lose the. Okay. Yeah. I, what, what, what I learned about developing character, mm-hmm. I learned from acting. Right. Um, and I used everything I learned in acting, writing this book. Um, so uh, anyway, I, the writing just left. I was doing other things. Um, and that for, for decades, I was doing other things. Um, we moved out here. My son went to high school. Um, the, his senior year in high school, he need a- after he graduated. I had he needed some help getting through high school. After he graduated, I retired from from programming, and I was like, I should be tutoring. I started tutoring while Alex, while my son was a senior in high school and I was right. looking for something to do. So I started tutoring writing. I used to be an English teacher. Sure. And at a certain point, I was so frustrated with the kids. I'm like, why am I trying to teach them to write? I should go back to writing. And, right. and so that's when I started writing again. And had you met Kim at that time? Or how did you meet Kim? Um, Kim was with doing workshops through uh, PDX Writers, which- Okay, that's a Portland group. It's a Portland group. It was mm-hmm. a generative writing group. Uh, you would go, you would get a prompt, you would write in, in a group for 10 minutes with this prompt. It was very generative. And then you would read and the feedback could only be positive because it was right. just, right? Yeah. Um, and this book started as one of Kim's exercises. It was take the same scene, and write it from two points of view. 
and Irv popped out and Irv was right there and um, wrote this other girl, Rose, who didn't stick around, came, was there. But that it, th- I, this book started with Kim's workshop. Um, wow. And that was 10 years ago. About 10 years ago. Yeah. It, time flies. Yeah. Um, I thought it really interesting how in part one, the people who are really cruel, as opposed to um, the, the guy who runs the sweatshop or owns the sweatshop, Margolis, um, were the fathers. Yeah. And yeah. that was a very interesting comment because we don't find that so often in historical fiction. Usually the fathers are sort of revered or is spoken about with all this tenderness or something about that. But this was like unimaginable cruelty. And then you take us to the magazine that was had the section devoted to men who had abandoned their families. Yeah. It's really, really real. I had not thought about that connection, but that's true, isn't it? Yeah, yeah. And remember, it was a very patriarchal society. Right. Um, uh, women were not supposed to read. Women were not theoretically not taught to read. Um, and the way you deal with Artie is also so deft. You know, I mean, you you bring up these colossal issues that many people would devote like whole sections of a book to and just do the one on one. And yet this is a detail. These are details. And yet they are driving Irving forward. It's I wish I wish I wrote that book. Oh, God dear. damn it. I mean, <laughs> just so great. Really good books. You don't need. You don't need to. You've got your own characters. I know, but my people just waffle on about you know whether the salmon's cooked properly or not. I mean, oh, it's, just, wow. it's, it's just so. I mean, it just really. But the thing with Irving that's also so interesting is that he's really unsure. Yes, he's so unsure, and you and you you give him that that tenderness where he might not make the right choice. And sometimes he doesn't. And it's just, right. and yet he keeps moving forward because you're going to bring him right forward 50 years like that. Yeah. Just, wow. I, what I, it always surprised me that I ended up with a male narrator and I realized it was because he's an observer and his observations allow me to, uh, somehow gave me an in into the women. You know, the women are the strong ones here. Right. Nettie and Miriam and even Shelley. They're yeah. they're they're the they're strong. tough. They're tough, all of them. And these mm-hmm. women and they were I mean, these women were tough. They yes. the women, they really were. So is Irving is not based on any one person, actually. He's um, based in here. Yeah. Yeah. He was just he was I, for, he was he was my in into talking about the women, and then I needed to give him a flaw. Somewhere along the way, as I was, you know, you you need your character to have challenges, right? So, and I learned from my acting that you give your character an operative word. You know, every character has an operative word. Um, Irving is passive. He's a he, he is essentially a passive character compared to Nettie or Miriam or even right. Leo and Shelley. He's, he's, he is passive. Um, so interesting. But mm. that passivity makes him a wonderful observer. Yes. And, and, and very sympathetic. And Yes. Right. Because he he's actually not the major instigator of almost except for Artie. He's Irv doesn't instigate most of you know the action in the book. Right, right. He's swept up in everything. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Golly, it somehow. Worked. So now you had said you had said um, that y- you didn't think there was another book in you, but yeah. 
I know for a fact there is one. I'm isn't starting. There? I'm starting to do research. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> so, what is driving that process? What's 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 that process? Is such a dumb word, but I mean, what is yeah. your process, Gail? There are a few things. One is I just don't know what to do with myself if I'm not writing. I miss. Not right. You might gamble or do off track betting, stuff like that. No, no, no. Yeah, right. Yeah, no. <laughs> yeah, sorry. I need, to, I, I'm right. I need to write. Um, right. And, and while I was doing the research for this book, I, 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 I went down so many different rabbit holes and discovered so many interesting things. And one of the things that kept popping up was this organization called the Women's Trade Union League. Yes. Um, and the women of the Women's Trade Union League. Mm -hmm. I'm a little concerned that it's too much the same subject and I might wind up not doing it because it has to be a different book than this book. And I haven't yet. I don't yet know what that is. Indeed, but, though, it could be certainly that's the setting. It doesn't yeah. need to be about that, but it could be the setting. These women were fascinating. They mm. were fascinating. And the and it it could potentially give me a chance to do a deeper dive into the poli into the intricacies of the politics, which I feel like I didn't I I set out to when I first started writing Seward Park, I thought I was going to do a deeper dive into the difference between anarchism and Marxism and the different, because it, the, the, I mean, the, the intricacies of the, of the fight of the intellectual fighting is extreme. Right. Everybody had their own newspaper and right. Yes. But I realized that as I started doing the research, I literally did not know enough to write about it. And it would take me years to learn enough to write about it in depth and how do you make a book out of a, a novel of interest out of that anyway? You know, right? Because we care about the people more than we exactly. care about the issues. Exactly. Mm. So, so I left that out. It just the book became something else. But I feel like maybe I I, I don't know. I'm just curious to see where I go with this other thing. I, I don't so, know. You know, I, I found that when I was working on my book, which takes place what. 80 years before, no, 70 years before your book does, my first book, right. um, that I was really astonished how many women were major players in the life of New York City. And I'm not talking about dinner party players, but uh, columnists, journalists, thinkers. Yes. And while women were not allowed to do this, they weren't allowed to do that, You know, they had no rights, they had very little agency and all that sort of thing. They were in fact respected by their colleagues, their male colleagues, you know, and, and we never, we don't learn about that. And I wonder if it has to do with um, the legend, you know, maybe it, it deflects from the legend or it makes it too nuanced or too complex. But, you know, there were a large number of men who were very, very um, committed to equal rights for women. Yes. And equality for women. And and they don't get a lot of uh, coverage, these guys. Hit, history is a lot more complex than what we're given. Yes. I mean, it really is. It's so much richer than what we're given. So that's what historical fiction does, right? That's what we right. can do. Right. With when this. it evokes something that yes. you just had no idea that it should be such a thing. Exactly. And yeah, it's very exactly. exciting. I'm yeah. peeling these things and finding out these people. But at the same time, there's so many people. It becomes problematic in terms of being able just to be laser focused. Yeah, because. I, I, yeah. Are you a, I'm a I'm a complete pantser. I I mean, literally. I, oh, yeah, I, I am a pantser. I, how about you? Yeah. yeah, I try. I try very hard to be a plotter. And in fact, um, since I found that that the, the sec, putting the second book out into the world has brought home the virtues of plotting in a way that putting the first book into the world and then starting the second book did not. You know, I gave the uh, plotting idea a very half-hearted effort 
with the, the second first book. With the second, okay. Yes. Well, the first one was all pantsing because I didn't know there was such a thing as plotting and pantsing. Okay. <laughs> I just, I just wrote. <laughs> and in the second book, I thought, oh, okay, well, I know what the story is, so I'm just going to plot it. And then after a few weeks, you know, when it wasn't like moving at lightning speed, I, I, I just started pantsing, did my usual pantsing routine. Then uh, now I'm, I'm on to a different period altogether, which is the Second World War and just before the Second World War. And in fact, um, the plotting is starting to take hold a little bit mm. in that. It seems to me, and I may be wrong about this, so I hope nobody's listening too closely. Um, it seems to be that you just have to get everything out on the page. Just get it on the page, everything. Yeah. In a, like a list, not like a list list, but like a list. Oh. Right, okay. A series of moments. And that's how you tell your book. Your book is a series of moments. That's what makes it so fabulous. But um, it, it, a series of moments, and then it seems that that's when we go back and we start making it a book, book I yeah. think. Uh, yeah. I don't know. Because the girl, my, my protagonist in the third book, she's from New York. And she's going to go to England because that's what all my people do that because that's what I did. We all we start in New York and then we go to England. And, yeah. um, and so she, her, her, her story starts in the, in the late 30s. But, um, you know, I'm very conscious of I have to get her here to here to here to here to here. And then this has to happen. This has to happen. This has to happen so that everything can go like that. And it's just a question of, it, I, at least I think, I don't know. It's, it's a mystery because, you know, at the end of the day, as a reader, we want to forget that we're reading. Right. And just be there in the book. Right. Yeah. And I, I think that sometimes people don't give us... Um, there are a lot of writers out there who don't give us that opportunity. They just, you know, I don't know. They, they don't want to be interrupted at book clubs. I don't know. <laughs> when I was working on this, we've got to, I'd never written a book. And, and, and I have and I, and I spent 30 years as a computer programmer, which mm -hmm. is linear, which is flow charting. You have to, you, you, and I found that every time I felt like I have to explain this and move my person from here to here in a logical manner. And say manner, it three times in different ways each time to show that I understand the concept. Uh, mm -hmm. um, it just died. The language died. The feeling died. It was, I was, pr I was writing computer code, not, not. So I, what I did for myself was I thought, I'm screw that. I thought, I'm going to write, I'm just going to write the scenes that are vivid in my mind. And I'm not going to worry about how they, about moving my character from one to the other. I'll figure that out later. Let me just get down what's That's vivid. really good advice. That's really good advice. Just be in those scenes and then how yeah. they get from there to there will work itself out. Yeah. Or I'll go, or, or it will come to me which is the other, that was the other really cool thing is it, 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 it's like, it's like dense black night and right. you're right. And then suddenly it comes to you what needs to happen next. So did you write the first strike, this, this, the strike in the 1916 section? Yeah. Did you write that many times before you decided to do with it what you did do with it? In the night, which was, you know, no, that one came real easy. Oh, really? So you knew exactly how you were going to let that narrative unfold. I just wrote the strike scene because, do you have you? It's based. It it's inspired by something real that happened. Have, have you ever heard of Clara Lemlich? No. Okay. Is she going to be one of my angry dead women? I think no, so. No, she should be one of your angry dead women. Okay, just a moment. I'm going to, ladies and gentlemen, I'm just going to write this down. Clara, L E M L I C H. Clara Lemlich. She was a 16-year-old shirtwaist worker, and there really was a huge strike called the Uprising of 20,000. I think it was 1909 
or 1911. I forget right. So now. it was after the shirt fa- shirtwaist factory. No, it was before. So that's right. It was 1909 because sh- Triangle was the fire was 1911. So okay. 1909. There's a lot of labor unrest. There's a huge meeting at Cooper Union in the big room at Cooper Union. Yeah. Samuel Gompers is there, and all the labor lead and the, and, and the women are furious and, and the labor lady or leading men are like, well, you can't have a strike. I know things are bad, but you have to wait. And right. a 16 year old girl walks up to the front and says, I need, I, we need to strike. We need a, to strike now. She raises her hand and said, and says, I vow to strike. If I go back on my vow, may God strike me that strike my hand away or words to that effect. And the entire room joins her and the strike starts based on Clara Lemlich. And she was 16 years old, 16 years old. Um, It's pretty fierce. There's this one. And so that's where the scene with Nettie got born. Mm -hmm. Um, Mm -hmm. It's a very Mm -hmm. famous moment in, and you should know Clara, uh, married and stayed a, a, a grassroots org- organizer her whole life. On her deathbed, she was in an old age home on her deathbed mm-hmm. trying to organize the caretakers to form a union. <laughs> that's, she that's, was, that, so that's why she should be in, in, one, in your book. Okay, was, okay. So, you know, the, so the, the podcast, it's really, it's about writing. It's about living in a digital world. And it's also about these forgotten people in history, usually women who we don't yeah. know about. And nobody cares about women who are happy as clams. We only like the angry dead ones. So Right. I hence. love your angry dead women. I love your angry dead women. I think yeah. it's a fabulous thing. So <laughs> isn't that amazing, though? I mean, somebody so young, but she had probably been working from the age of eight. That's right. You know? Yeah, and she'd probably been working twelve hours a day. Um, the one of the women I'm researching right now, I was literally spent the morning researching, is a woman yeah. named Pauline Newman, who was also a, a real in the Women's Trade Union League and a, a labor organizer her whole life. She started working at um, at twelve. At sixteen. There was a huge rent strike in Lower Manhattan, mm-hmm. and she and her friends at 16 organized the largest rent strike in history in New York history up to that point. Um, at 15, she forced her way into the Socialist Literary Society, which only admitted men, and demanded that they let her come and read and get educated. She was 15 years old. These girls were something. And, you know, you think about their moms, like we don't, their moms don't really come into the, yeah. into the mix too much, but you know, something in those moms, and maybe it was in the mother's milk or whatever it was, was like, you make sure you get what's right. Yeah. Yeah. Something. I think wow. I think women hold the world together. Personally, I think women are the glue. You know, well, that's very interesting because also we have these very cannibalistic tendencies, which are kind of unwieldy. This sort of got to devour our own if somebody's too awkward or too this or too that. Gail, thank you so very, 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 very much. I can't wait to read what's oh. next. Oh, what thank, you do you. Next. thank you. Thank you. This has been really fun. We should do it without, without. Okay. I, I agree. I agree. <laughs>